Hello and welcome to today's video. So at this time we're going to be taking our fourth look through the classic pocketbook Star Trek range. Some fantastic books in here today, which I'm sure you're going to enjoy. So sit back, relax, and let's get to it. So we open with book number 28, and you see they're numbered in the corner there, in the ongoing pocketbooks Star Trek, the original series. And this one here, was published originally in March 1986. It's Crisis on Centaurus by Brad Ferguson. So after a series of computer malfunctions on board the Enterprise, the ship must seek assistance at a nearby starbase. However, the planet Centaurus has been bombed, leaving thousands dead. So Kirk must put the repairs to one side and help with the rescue effort. This plant is also the home to Dr. McCoy's daughter, Joanna. So Brad Ferguson was 13 when Star Trek first aired, and he confesses to thinking it was the first science fiction show that was done right. He had bought an Apple Mac in 1984 and fancied writing a novel on it. He chose Star Trek as he'd read a lot of the earlier novels. He felt that they were a bit Spock-centric and or just a standard SF novel with some Star Trek references thrown in to make it a TV tie-in. Now he says he wasn't paid much for the story, which was accepted straight away by series editor Karen Haas, even though it sold 300,000 copies. He did leave the story open to a sequel, but it just never happened. He would later write a few more Trek novels alongside other works. Let's just have a little look at the back here. So, Crisis on Centaurus. Massive computer malfunctions are plaguing the Enterprise when Kirk suddenly receives a shocking message from Starfleet Command. Centaurus has been bombed and annihilated. Thousands are dead. Give whatever help you can. Centaurus is a beautiful, peaceful planet home to many humans, including McCoy's daughter, Joanna. The crew risks beaming down to investigate, but Kirk is thrown into a deadly struggle between violent enemy terrorists and vengeful Centaurans. Now, Lieutenant Uhura, left alone in command, must jeopardise the crippled Enterprise to save Centaurus, Kirk and Joanna McCoy. A science fiction book club alternate selection. There we are. How cool is this? It's got a lovely Boris Bellagio cover. He has actually signed that one there. And a nice rendition of McCoy's daughter as well. So yeah, pretty cool this one, especially the section with Uhura in command of the Enterprise. Um, it says, although the star date implies that the events take place after Star Trek The Motion Picture, the ranks and the cover image would suggest that this was actually set during the original five-year mission. Good stuff. So book 29 is Dreadnought by Diane Carey. So this is the first of a two-part story. Its sequel, Battle Stations, we'll see in a couple of books' time. So this story is unusual as it's told from the perspective of a young Starfleet Academy graduate, Piper. A secret starship, the Star Empire, which is a massive Dreadnought-class ship, is hijacked and the Enterprise, with Piper aboard, are summoned to rendezvous with it. Now, Diane says that when she first watched the Star Trek, it was thanks to her dad, who was a captain in the US Marine Corps. She says she watched all the popular shows of the time with him and learned to get a military mindset and a clear idea of good guys versus bad guys. She was already a published author when she tried her hand at Star Trek novels, and this was by no means her last. So let's read the back cover blurb then. So it says, Star Empire is the Federation's most powerful new weapon, a dreadnought, first in a class of super starships capable of outgunning a dozen Klingon cruisers or subduing a galaxy. On the eve of her maiden voyage, Star Empire is stolen by terrorists who demand a rendezvous with the Enterprise and with Lieutenant Piper, stationed aboard Kirk's ship on her first training cruise. Now Piper must discover why her friends from Starfleet are among the terrorists, and why they insist the ship was stolen not to attack the Federation, but to save it. Once again, a lovely Boris cover on that one. 
And it's good to see this approach being taken in the books um, with a lowly crew member, the centre of the action, something that would happen a few times in the various TV episodes, most notably, of course, in Lower Decks. So book number 30 is Demons by J.M. Dillard. This one published in July 1986. So on the Vulcan, the inhabitants are starting to act strangely, even Sarak. The Enterprise is sent to investigate when a murder both on the planet and on board the ship alert Captain Kirk to the danger they are facing. This novel was followed by a Star Trek The Next Generation sequel, Possession, which we'll get to in a future video. Dillard, whose real name is Jean Calogritis, says she remembers the inspiration for this novel came when she was staying late in an old Gothic building around the time of Halloween and imagining Spock staring at Sarek and saying, that's not my father. So let's read the uh, back cover blurb here. So it says, long before the Federation, a powerful force invaded our galaxy and almost destroyed it, a force that began with possession and madness and ended in murder. A Starfleet research expedition to the farthest reaches of the galaxy has unearthed that force once again and brought its silent evil back to the planet Vulcan. Now Spock must defeat the demons that threaten his friends and family, or the Enterprise will become the instrument of the galaxy's destruction. Now, this is a beautiful, really vivid, bright Boris cover. The author says that the woman in it, Anitra, actually looked a bit like her back then. And I enjoy it because it is something a little bit different, a story with a, with a supernatural twist. Great to see so much of the story take place on Vulcan as well. Now, this novel got two sequels, the original series novel, Bloodthirst, and a Star Trek The Next Generation novel, Possession. The next one we've got is the first giant novel that we've seen, Enterprise The First Adventure by Vonda N. McIntyre. So this one comes in at 370 pages, and it's not part of the numbered series, but this is, as published, where it fits into the main run, sort of chronologically, and was published September 1986. The story focuses on the young Enterprise crew and the mission that first brought them all together. Kirk is the youngest person to ever be promoted to captain, yet his crew find him difficult to work with. They have to quickly put aside their differences when a huge spacecraft appears on their trajectory. So there is the, uh, the sort of die cut cover. And it reveals the full Boris artwork underneath, although it's unsigned. Now, this book was also released as a hardback for the Science Fiction Book Club with a full wraparound cover, which shows the rest of the crew. Let's read the back blurb here. So it's Star Trek The Adventure Begins. And it's got a little um, endorsement by Gene Roddenberry. Look, I heartily recommend Enterprise The First Adventure as a most creative and enjoyable tale of Star Trek's beginnings. So it actually had his blessing. So it says he was the youngest man to captain a starship in Federation history. His crew, including an untried first officer and a maverick ship surgeon, in the years to come, the voyages of Captain James T. Kirk and the USS Enterprise would become legend. But before their historic five-year mission began, before the crew meshed into the superb unit that would journey across the galaxy, before the legend took shape, there was the mission that brought them together for the first time. Here at last is that untold story, the first voyage of Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy and all the rest of the Enterprise crew the most eagerly awaited Star Trek adventure of all. There we are, eh? So this one, of course, was written by Trek veteran Vonda M. McIntyre, and it really is a fan's dream. It's a superb story and deserving of the extra pages. It really is good fun waiting for the next sort of classic character to appear. And Janice Rand is in this, as is uh, Christopher Pike. Good stuff. So book 31, then back to the numbered series, and this is... Battle Stations by Diane Carey. So this one is the sequel to Dreadnought that we saw a little bit earlier. An experimental transwarp drive has been stolen and Captain Kirk is the main suspect. Lieutenant Commander Piper is the only person capable of stopping the conspiracy and rescuing the captain. See, this one's got a little Odyssey 7 
stab. That's a very early, uh, well, 80s uh, science fiction shot back in the day. So back on Earth, enjoying a well-deserved shore leave, Captain Kirk is rudely accosted by a trio of Starfleet security guards. It seems he is wanted for questioning in connection with the theft of Transwarp, the Federation's newest, most advanced propulsion system. Could Captain Kirk, Starfleet's most decorated hero, be guilty of stealing top-secret technology? With the aid of Mr. Spock, Lieutenant Commander Piper begins a desperate search for the scientists who develop Transwarp, a search that leads her to an isolated planet where she discovers the real and very dangerous traitor. So, according to the author, the first book had done so well, pocketbook Star Trek editor Karen Haas asked Carrie for a follow-up, ASAP. This was promptly produced then in just six weeks and again proved to be a bestseller. When the two books were reprinted, they were given the series prefix, Fortunes of War. Now this one here is, once again, it's a Boris cover, but there's uh, no evidence of a signature anywhere, but it's a really, really nice cover, that one. So next up, we've got Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. And this one was published in February 86. Once again, by Vonda M. McIntyre, uh, but based on the screenplay by Steve Marison, Peter Chris, Harv Bennett, and Nicholas Mayer, with a story by Leonard Nimoy and Harv Bennett. Now, the novelization of the fourth Star Trek movie, The Voyage Home, was also not published as part of the main numbered Star Trek series. It was a standalone novel. And maybe this was a decision to not alienate the more casual reader, perhaps, who might just pick this up rather than see it as book number 32 and uh, think he needs to have read loads more just to enjoy the book. Now, the book follows the original Harve Bennett and Leonard Nimoy story very closely, and like the earlier adaptions by Von der N. McIntyre, doesn't really add anything that's not seen on screen. That's not to say it's not a good book. Star Trek and time travel have had a generally good history, and this is no exception. It's just that the scenes and the characters are indelibly ingrained in your mind. And if you've seen the movie enough times, which I certainly have, um, it almost makes this book a little bit redundant. Perhaps one for the completists only. The uh, cover, incidentally, is the original teaser movie poster before that beautiful quad with the uh, Klingon bird of prey over the uh, uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but this teaser poster is by the artist Bob Peak. Now, we're about halfway through, so I just thank my Patreon and channel members. So book 32 is Chain of Attack by Jean Duis. Now this one was published in February 1987. So the Enterprise has travelled through an interstellar gate, a bit like a wormhole, and finds itself in a distant galaxy. With no way back, the ship spends weeks trying to find another way home, with the Enterprise slowly losing power. Kirk attempts to broker a peace with two warring factions. Now, this one also got a sequel, The Final Nexus, which is book 43 in this series. I always remember it as the first book to launch the Titan Books UK editions of these Star Trek novels, which had a different numbering system to the USA releases. Now, let's have a little read of the back here. So, while mapping a series of gravitational anomalies, the Enterprise is suddenly hurled millions of light years through space, into a distant galaxy of scorched and lifeless worlds, into the middle of an endless interstellar war. With no way back home, the crippled starship finds itself under relentless and suicidal attack by both warring fleets. And Captain Kirk must gamble the lives of his crew on his ability to stop a war that has raged for centuries and ravaged a galaxy. So author Jean Deweese first saw Star Trek at the fabled World Sci-Fi Convention when Gene Roddenberry showed both pilots to an audience of predominantly SF fiction fans. He had already written a couple of Man From U.N.C.L.E. TV times and he submitted script ideas for Star Trek's original second season, unsuccessfully. 
His agent gave him the heads up when years later, Pocket Books Trek editor David Hartwell was looking for new Trek fiction and he sent in his idea. It was four years before it finally saw print. Now, I did some research and this does not appear to be a Boris cover, but I could not find out who actually did that original cover artwork. So if you do know, drop a comment down below. So that's book 32. So book 33 is Deep Domain by Howard Weinstein, and this was published in April 1987. So when Spock and che Chekhov take a shuttle to the planet Akala, they both promptly disappear. The scientific outpost has made a discovery that various government officials are being hushed up. It's up to Kirk to discover what's going on and rescue the scientists and his crew members. So in the author's note at the start here, Weinstein states that the events in this novel take place in the years following the encounter with Viger in Star Trek The Motion Picture. He also said that the idea for the book stems from when he was asked to come up with a concept for Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, where he does indeed get an on-screen credit. Pretty cool. So it says on the back here, a routine diplomatic visit to the water world of Akala becomes a nightmarish search for a missing Spock and Chekhov, a search that plunges Admiral Kirk headlong into a corrupt government's desperate struggle to retain power. For both the Federation science outpost and Akala's valiant freedom fighters have begun uncovering the ancient secrets hidden beneath her tranquil oceans. Secrets whose exposure may mean civil war for the people of Akala and death for the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Pretty cool stuff. Now this, once again, looks like a Boris cover, but there's no sign of a signature. And I, I couldn't find out who did, the, uh, did this cover artwork online either. So it's a pretty cool to story, and you can see the similarities uh, between this and Star Trek IV, not least of which the whales. Weinstein had met with Voyage Home director Leonard Nimoy and bounced around story ideas for that film, and it's from this meeting that the humpbacks were incorporated into that movie. Although his actual story wasn't what got filmed for Star Trek IV, Weinstein did turn the idea into his novel, Deep Domain, and recalls being able to visit the set to see the actual film get made. How cool is that? So book 34 then, published in June 87, is Dreams of the Raven by Carmen Carter. A seemingly routine rescue mission becomes a battle for survival when Dr. McCoy gets injured and starts believing he is only 23 and has no memory of Starfleet or his friends aboard the Enterprise. <laughs> so merchant ship's frantic SOS sends the Enterprise speeding to the rescue. But the Starship's mission of mercy soon becomes a desperate struggle for survival against a nightmarish enemy Captain Kirk can neither identify nor understand. An enemy who must defeat without the aid of his most trusted officers. For the Leonard McCoy Kirk knew is gone. In his place stands a stranger, a man with no memory of his Starfleet career, his family, his friends, or the one thing James T. Kirk needs most of all, his dreams. Mm, so once again, no cover artist on this one. Um, although it's a really excellent jacket. Really, really detailed. So Carmen Carter had been a Star Trek fan all her life. When the series finished its original run, she turned her hand to fan fiction. She wrote a few general science fiction short stories before, before having a go at a full-length Star Trek novel. Once this was finished, she presented it to her agent, who forwarded it on to Pocket, and within a year it was printed. She's still very proud of it today. It's interesting as it focuses on a time in McCoy's early life when he had split from his partner and decided in bitterness really to join Starfleet. At the end of this book, it does include the first few pages to the second giant novel in the series. And here it is, Let's Strangers from the Sky, which chronologically is the next one to get published. And look, it says coming next month, the second giant Star Trek adventure. And it gives you the first uh, sort of glimpse of it. And I don't mind that when uh, series do that. I think it's quite a, quite a good idea. So let's have a look at Strangers from the Sky now. So Strangers from the Sky, this giant novel here, written by Margaret Wander Bonanno, 
was published in July 1987. Now, this is basically three short novels which have been combined into one larger work. The books are even split out evenly inside the novel. In the first book, which is set just after Star Trek The Motion Picture, McCoy is trying to convince Kirk to read a popular new book called Strangers from the Sky. The second book tells the story of Vulcan's first contact with humans in the 21st century. Then the final book takes place just before the episode where no man has gone before. While Kirk reads the book, he starts to have dreams that convince him he was on Earth when the Vulcans first make contact. Spock starts to believe this also. Then the three books interweave with each other to create one giant novel. Let's have a little look on the back here. So it began with Enterprise, which you've seen over there, the nationwide bestseller that, saw, that told of the legendary Star Trek crew's first adventure together. Now here is the second giant Star Trek novel. So evidently that had done well. So in the 21st century, united at last after countless years of warfare, humanity turns towards the stars. But when an alien spacecraft crash lands in the South Pacific, bearing visitors from another world, the Vulcans, Earth must decide whether to extend the hand of friendship or the fist of war. While in the distant future, horrible dreams torment Admiral James T. Kirk, Dreams prompted by his reading of Strangers from the Sky, a book about that historic first contact. Dreams of an alternate reality where he somehow changed the course of history and destroyed the Federation before it began. Now, once again, this has got that die cut cover like the other giant novel. And underneath, Boris is clearly credited there as an artist. Now, I noticed that these giant novels were priced at $3.95. And that's just 45 cents more than a, um, more expensive than a regular Trek novel. You have to wonder, did Margaret Wander Bonanno, did she have lots of different story ideas? And they said, look, take these three, roll them into one giant novel. I don't know. Anyway, that's a really, really nice copy of that one. And it's a great, great book. So uh, one to get your hands on. So book 35 in the series is The Romulan Way. And this was uh, written by Diane Duane and Peter Moorwood and published in August 1987. So Federation citizen has been living a secret life with the Romulans for the past eight years when a Starfleet officer is captured. Therese Lobruto must choose between destroying her cover or saving the life of Dr. McCoy. Now, this one is the sequel to My Enemy, My Ally and the second in the Rai Hansu novel series. Now, the next novel in this sequence is Sword Hunt. The split between the Vulcan and the Romulans will be explored in Diane Duane's next book, Spock's World. So let's have a look at the back cover blurb here. So they are a race of warriors, a noble people to whom honor is all. They are cousin to the Vulcan, ally to the Klingon, and Starfleet's most feared and cunning adversary. They are the Romulans, and for eight years, Federation agent Therese Labruto has hidden in their midst. Now the presence of a captured Starfleet officer forces her to make a fateful choice between exposure and escape, between maintaining her cover and saving the life of Dr. Leonard McCoy. Here, in a starkly different adventure, is the truth behind one of the most fascinating alien races ever created in Star Trek. The Romulans. It's funny, in a lot of these books tonight, we've seen McCoy in some sort of peril, haven't we? <laughs> now, once again, no cover artist is actually credited, although it does look very much like Boris. Now, can you see those two little ships there? I'm going to zoom right in so you can have a look. They are actually modelled, although they're very, very much like the Colonial Vipers from Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Bit of a cross-series cross, cross series, uh mistake there um, and managed to get away with it but hey really interesting that so the co-author of this is peter morwood now that's actually diane duane's husband and they just got married when this was being uh, put together so diane had written her outline but she also landed a role as script editor on the animated series dino saucers her husband who was also a writer uh, was between work and using Diane's story outline was able to finish the novel in her style and present it to Pocket Books on time. So there you go, amazing, eh? Now we've got just one more to look at today. 
and it's book 36, How Much for Just the Planet, the new novel by John M. Ford, published October 1987. So this Star Trek novel brings an element of comedy to the universe as we see the classic rivalry of humans versus Klingons come into play. Here, the two races are fighting over dilithium crystal rites on the planet Diredi, which has tons of it. As per the Prime Directive, the dilithium mining rights should go to the race which uses the crystals the most wisely. The local inhabitants, however, are only really interested in enjoying the contest for their own amusement, which results in the Enterprise crew singing Gilbert and Sullivan at one point. So, dilithium, in crystalline form, the most valuable mineral in the galaxy. It powers the Federation starships and the Klingon Empire's battle cruisers. Now, on a small out-of-the-way planet named Duridi, the greatest fortune in dilithium crystals ever seen has been found. Under the terms of the Organium Peace Treaty, the planet will go to the side best able to develop the planet and its resources. Each side will contest the prize with the prime of its fleet. For the Federation, Captain James T. Kirk and the Starship Enterprise. For the Klingons, Captain Caden, Vesti, Oprai and the Fire Blossom. Only the Doridians are writing their own script for this content, contest, a script that propels the crew of the Enterprise into their strangest adventure yet. So once again, this does look like a Boris cover with really, really great detail, but once again, it's uncredited. So I don't mind these sorts of books once in a while. It's like when a long running TV series does something a little bit different. It doesn't really hurt, but I wouldn't want it all the time. And that's the same with this. The writing is fine, and after all, it is set within the Star Trek universe. The best way to think of it is a bit like The Trouble with Tribbles or Mud's Women. Star Trek with a bit of a comedy twist. And that's it for today's video. I do hope you've enjoyed looking through these Star Trek books as much as I have. Thanks very much for watching today. Do please hit that subscribe button if you've not already for regular Star Trek videos and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Live long and prosper. Bye.